today we're going to be talking about photosynthesis, the process through which plants harvest the energy of the sun. The ultimate goals in this particular chapter, we're going to talk about ATP and its role in cellular activities. We're going to explain where plants get the energy they need to produce food. You're going to be able to explain the role of what's called the light reactions and the pigments that are needed in photosynthesis. We're going to be able to talk about the overall net chemical equation for photosynthesis and finally describe the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. We're actually going to start at the end of this because I think the end of it is why is this important for us to learn. And the important part of this is in the end we need energy and that energy is in the form of something called adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate is a form of energy and energy is the ability to do work. So anytime we want to move something or flex our muscles or our heart beats or the lungs ex expand and contract, your cells need energy in order to perform that. Almost all energy on the planet, almost all life rather, gets its energy from the sun. And so the plants are harvesting that sunlight energy, they are turning it into molecules that we will eat and consume that we can then turn into usable energy, and that usable energy is in the form of adenosine triphosphate. The cells themselves use and store energy in two different ways. Long-term storage are fats and carbohydrates, and we've talked about this before in the macromolecules chapter. Fats are for a long time of storage, and carbohydrates are for short term. So if you want to run a marathon race or something, you might, the night before, consume some pasta, because in the next couple of hours you can use those carbohydrates. Fats, on the other hand, tend to be for longer term and are even permanent. You have the fact of hey, bears, before they hibernate for the winter, which is a period of low activity, they'll eat a bunch and get fat because they're not going to be doing much during those winter months. The short-term use of energy, meaning I need to use that energy right now, well, we can't use those carbohydrates and fats directly. We have to use adenosine triphosphate, ATP, in order to make that happen. So ATP is not a good way to store energy. Cells just make it enough to use. As ATP accumulates, the cells have to use that up. Most of the ATP is used in your cells just to maintain your, your body temperature. You're burning that just to maintain a homeostasis of your current 37 degrees Celsius body temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a short schematic look at what the ATP molecule looks like. You'll see that it has several carbon rings, and remember each of these little points here is a carbon surrounded by so many different hydrogen atoms. And I've emitted, uh, I think, some oxygens on here just to make it a little bit more simple. But we can actually break this up into some parts. And so the part here that's got this double ring, you got a hexagon and a pentagon. This is a molecule called adenine, which you'll hear of again when we talk about DNA. The uh, pinkish purplish pentagon here is a sugar called ribose, which again you'll hear about when we talk about DNA. And attached to that ribose is a chain of phosphate groups. Remember, phosphate groups are phosphorus surrounded by four oxygens, which I've exemplified here by yellow. And they are loosely bonded together with these little red squiggly lines. So the ATP is made from the food energy that you consume. So your cells are taking that food into the cells, into the mitochondria. The mitochondria are turning that, that food, the carbohydrates, into... ATP. And of course, the one main source of food in plants is called glucose. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. It's easily broken down from more complex carbohydrates like starches and, and just regular old table sugar. And so glucose is one of these main components. There's other simple sugars like that that can be used, but glucose is the most important one. Cells use ATP by breaking the bonds between that second and third phosphate group that I'm circling here with my mouse. So that is the break right there that causes that energy to be released. When that third phosphate group is broken, what happens is you go from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate, which is labeled as ADP. ADP is kind of like an empty battery, and I have a little picture here to show you that. When you have those three phosphates, you have a tremendous amount of energy stored up. 
once that third phosphate group is broken off, and so you can see the phosphate groups is the P, the little pink circles are the oxygen surrounding it. Once you break that off, you have now adenosine diphosphate because you went from three to two phosphates, and you have this massive release of energy. This adenosine diphosphate then is recycled in the cells, and other phosphates are attached to it. And that's part of that next process we'll talk about called cellular respiration is the making of adenosine triphosphate. So I've circled here, adenosine triphosphate is like a charged battery, diphosphate is like an empty battery. So once you break off that phosphate group, the energy is used up for your cells. And then the ADP gets recycled. So as we talk about photosynthesis, we can break organisms into two groups. There's organisms that are able to make their own food, and those organisms are called autotrophs. Organisms that can't make their own food, like us, we have to ingest the food, we are called heterotrophs. And there's a special group of organisms that that can actually get energy from other sources other than sunlight. These are usually organisms that are living on volcanic rift valleys at the bottom of the ocean floor. They're almost always bacteria. Those are called chemotrophs. So let's break these words down to understand where this is coming from. The word auto means self. The word hetero means other or different. The root keem means chemical and the suffix troph means nourishment. So autotroph means self-nourishment. You're able to get your own food. That food can be get, gotten into the mitochondria of the, the plant cells and used up. Heterotrophs, we have to ingest our food. We can't make it. Chemotrophs can use the energy of these volcanic rift valleys uh, where all this heat and stuff is, and they can make their own chemicals, but that's very rare. Um, there's a lot of hope that perhaps... Um, Alien life can be found on some planets that don't have um, the, the same qualities of Earth does, and there's a good chance that chemotrophs provide evidence that that could happen. You don't need sunlight or anything like that. The last part of today's lesson is on leaf anatomy. You're going to eventually be coloring that. Uh, leaves, as they are set up here, um, you may think of them as very, very thin, but they're, you know, they're several cells thick, so we're going to take a look at what these cell layers do. The first top part of the cells, if you ever looked at a leaf, pulled it off of a tree and looked at it, the top of the leaf is usually kind of a waxy, uh, shiny looking material, and that's an emission called a cuticle. It's kind of like a, a layer of skin, a layer of oil. Uh, I don't know if it's actually oil or not, but it's a layer of a compound that kind of protects the cell from evaporation from water and things like that. There's a layer of cells right underneath that, that layer called the epidermis. Uh, you can kind of think of those as like skin cells and they will emit this waxy substance on top. Right underneath there, you can see these elongated cells in, this, in the uh, cross-section of the leaf here. These are called mesophyll cells, and this is where photosynthesis is actually going to happen. The sunlight's going to be shining down from the top, and you see these cells are elongated to maximize the amount of time that the light is inside those cells. So you've got a lot of activity happening in those cells. So this is the layer of cells in a generic plant cell where all this action is taking place. Uh, then down here you got a structure, this is a vein where water and waste can be removed, water comes in, waste can be removed. You have gaps in here, uh, probably not just air gaps, but there's probably some water and liquid and stuff inside of here as they go into the veins. Uh, you have some weird looking cells over here that are kind of like horseshoe shaped. Uh, and these can expand and contract, and what they do is they open and close, and they allow gases to be exchanged on the bottom of the leaf. These are called stoma. And so when they're open, oxygen and carbon dioxide can flow both directions. The cuticle on top is going to prevent that. So the gases are coming in through the bottom. These stoma cells are also called guard cells because they guard the plants. And so when it's really sunny and hot outside, they're going to close up because when it's sunny and hot outside, you can lose water. You don't want to lose water from your plant. And then when it cools off or it starts to get to be nighttime or close to dusk, they can open up and allow the gases to be exchanged. And that ends today's mini lesson on photosynthesis.